one thing that's mis- misnomer or just people don't understand is that the best players in the world, they do not. Nobody plays GTO. Nobody in the world, no human being could ever play uh, Game Theory Optimal. It's not even humanly possible. What the best players do is they combine the knowledge, just like this book says, Michael Acevedo's book on the cover, Modern Poker Theory. It says, building an unbeatable strategy based on GTO principles, not solely, right? So it's like, that's the book that, the Modern Poker Theory book that Michael wrote. Um, based on GTO principles, right? So you're using GTO as, as, the, as a barometer, as a Nash equilibrium, whatever you want to call it, to make exploits. Because the best players exploit. Yes, absolutely. Always looking to exploit. What you find, though, is at the highest levels, you don't get, you don't get to exploit to extremes like we did back in the day. You, you don't get to. Because if you do, they'll exploit the shit out of you, right? So, for example, let's, use, let's explain that. All right. In 2004, I won everything. Guess what? On the turn in the river, if I bet big, I was never bluffing. Like maybe once in the entire year I was bluffing. Okay. Why was I doing that? Okay. I was doing that because people were calling way too often. They did not fold often enough. They were calling me. They were paying me off in these spots. Right. So I was playing an exploitative strategy and it worked. But today, if everyone knows that they're going to see what I'm doing, and instead of me exploiting them, they exploit me by just folding because they know, you know, they know that I'm playing an exploitative style. Similar to, and we've talked about this before, similar to rock, paper, scissors, right? Let's say you notice a guy plays rock every single time, right? So what do you do, right? Now you think to yourself, all right, okay, well, I'm going to play paper and every time. So I'm going to do it like, and then 10 times in a row, you play paper. Guess what the other guy sees? The other guy's, you know what? I notice this guy's playing paper every time. So I'm going to play scissors. So you went from exploiting him to him notice that he's getting exploited and now flipping the script on you. I'm going to three bet this one. Two, 12.5. So you get that. Does that make sense, right? You see this guy's playing rock every single time. You go, aha, I figured it out. I'm going to play paper now every single time. Okay. Well, how long before your opponent goes, wait a minute. This guy's playing paper every time. So he goes, ah, uh-uh, ah, scissors. Now you're the one, oh shit. If you keep playing paper, you're fucked. But, you know, then, and then what you end up getting is what's, what's considered more like of a balance where you get back to more GTO, which is to play paper, rock, and scissors about a third of the time each. So one of the tricks or one of the ways to exploit somebody properly is not to overdo it, right? So if you notice the guy was playing rock every single time, okay? The play is not to play paper 100% of the time because if you do that, you're going to teach him. He's going to learn and he's going to switch it up, right? Instead, how about this? Instead, you play paper, instead of 33%, 33%, 33%, how about you play paper like 40%, okay? So you play paper 40% of the time, right? Now, you're going to print and he's going to think he's just running bad or unlucky or that you're just lucky, right? Because he won't notice it as much. But when you go extreme, that's when you run the risk of, reversing it where you're no longer exploiting your opponent they're exploiting you okay i'll fold this a3 suited okay what do we got here's the math on this we have threes it's not our flop Again, it's going to be a tough read for a lot of you. Just, just warning. Um, he does a good job of explaining the different vernacular and what they mean and stuff like that. But for a lot of you, it's going to be a lot to wrap your head around. I would suggest, like, don't be over, um, I guess, intimidated by all the math in there. It sort of does it for you a little bit. And just focus on just sort of the general principles. Could bluff this river. Let's see. Ah, fuck. What does he have any king in here? King X in here? I'm gonna go ahead and do it. Whatever. Maybe you know, you know, there's a spot, there's a chance I can get all the way through. Like, if nobody has a king, I get half if they call. If I get raised, I obviously fold. 
Nobody else has ace king. We know that for sure. So we got one fold. And we're playing the board here. Eight, nine, ten, jack, queen. So the question is, does Jizz go ahead and uh, call with the board? Will he call with the board? Will he raise us with a king? If he raises us, I will fold. Okay, so sweet. We have the board, right? So we were entitled to three chips, essentially, because there's nine in there. We're entitled to three, but we ended up winning all nine because we took the initiative there. King seven suited, all right. I'm gonna fold this one. Tight is right. I don't really, I mean, like I said, I know that a lot of people will have king seven suited there in their calling range um, from the small blind. I don't like playing on the small blind all that often as a caller because you play it three ways out of position often when the big blind defends and they're getting a very good price to do so. Especially as the shacks, stacks get more shallow because then you have the big blind squeeze a lot more often. So you don't close the action. So sometimes you're gonna put in like, you know, two and a half bigs or whatever, and not even get to see the flop. We got a WNBA team, the Las Vegas Aces. The only one who chose to use a very, you know, pokery kind of name. All right, so this is gonna be a check call with bottom pair, backdoor flush draw. He has a major range advantage here. Some of the things we talked about with theory is like, who on, in general, when you think about Harko's range and my range, who is more likely to have more equity on an ace-10-6 flop? It's always him because he has a tighter range that's more ace-condensed, and mine is going to be really wide, right? Because I'm going to play all kinds of garbage from the big blind. Okay, that's an interesting flop turn card. So that's where we bet 1.5. No, we bet 1. This is just, We just fold to a raise here. So this is, again, a game theory principle where when that middle card pairs, that, that benefits us because we have a lot more 10x in our hand than he does. How about on this river, I'm just gonna check. So it's basically like a check, right? I bet one chip into 10, so 10% pot. Oh wow, look at that, see he didn't even bet. He's ace. So I didn't have to make any tough decision, I just, for one chip. The thing is, I will have a 10 and do that too, right? So that's something that through my study I found was really a unique, a uniquely like consistent play that solvers love and again it's based off of the fact that that card's gonna benefit my range all right i'm gonna three bet this one we're gonna go to 7.7 we're not we're folding to a three bet we're folding to a four bet of course this is just a bluff again he's raising another gun which is going to be a relatively tight range but when i three bet him here he should give me credit for something pretty decent and I do block some hands, so we pick it up with the king jack. Very nice. Jack 10 suited. Don't mind if I do. Let's see. I'm going to flat this one. Let's see, let's see. That's a whiff and a miss. But I will bet the flop if he checks. Very reasonable that I can have an ace here. And he has a whole bunch of hands like king, queen, whatever, that struggle. So I'm going to bet small, 27%, with the jack 10. And if he calls, we have to have some concern based on what we've seen. Okay, so very nice. He just check folds. He must have had, you know, two broadways, king 8 suited, king 9 suited, who knows. Okay, so here we are. We are we're cruising along here, slowly but surely, sitting pretty. Average stack is 80. We got 91, right? If you want to look at the actual stack, we started with 25. We got 36. You know, nothing crazy so far. Let's take a flop with the old loosey goosey jizzes. He's nice. Uh, attempts to steal is not actually that high. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we've got. Ace high and an open and a straight draw with backdoor hearts. It's going to be a check and probably call. Yeah, just call. Never mind, we probably just check call. One point nine. Okay. Let's go ahead and see the turn. Turns a seven. I'm gonna actually do something goofy here. 
I'm going to build one chip. It's not that goofy, because like I said, it's that same concept where seven, we have more seven X in our range than he does when he bets this flop. You know what, you know? A lot of people just really don't know how to react to this yet. They don't really have a deep, like, what do I do here? He just one chip, all right. Gave ourselves a, basically a free draw in case he was going to bet. And now we have to decide if we're going to bluff it. And I think the answer to that question is no. I think we're going to just check and hope ace-10 is good. It's not, though. We're just dead. You could have king-10, I guess. You could have king-10, king-jack. That's about it. That's all we beat. Because now the queen got there. So queen-jack, queen-10, we lose to those. So we can't call a bet here. There's not enough... Not enough for that range, especially against the pot size bet. There's not enough bluffs, right? I mean, in theory, you could have like, what, ace three of hearts or something, but that's kind of goofy, so we just fold. But again, we got to see the turn card for one. Uh -huh. This is so confusing. Mm. Again, what's important to note is when we throw out that one chip bet, that does not mean it's yours to take because we will do that. We will do that with when we have it too. Just as often, frankly. Because basically, when that card pairs in that spot, I'm betting, or like the middle card pairs, I'm betting every time, pretty much. And I'm betting one chip. So you decide. And here's the thing. I'm betting in a spot where I'm way more likely to have it than you. Just in theory. Again, talking about range versus range. My range will have a seven more often than his. By a wide margin. So... Go ahead, try to attack those bets if you like. But now you open up the opportunity for you to get re-raised, right? So a lot of people, they're like, oh, he just bet one. Let me make it seven or eight just to see where I'm at or whatever. And then you re-raise and you're like, oh, fuck. And I've done that as a bluff plenty too. It's tough to play against, yo. Okay, now we have kings. So in this situation off 25 big blinds, I'll probably play it. Six-handed, you know? If it was eight-handed, no, no way. But six-handed, pair of kings, pretty good. Now we hope somebody raises, obviously. So on this stack size, the question is, do we have three bettable stack? We do, because he's only min-raised. So I can make it 5.8. Leaving us 20 behind. Giving him a chance to say, come on. All right, he came. Now we're gonna, so I'm gonna check about half the time with my over pairs here. And this is gonna be one of them. That's a flop that he can absolutely hit. He's gonna have a 10 here, a decent amount. If he does, we'll get it in against him. What I'm doing here is for balance. I don't always bet when I have kings. If you always bet when you have the over pair and check when you don't, Again, you become really easy to play against. So you mix it up. All right, so let's see now. Now we're gonna go with the large bet. Now we're gonna go with the large bet. I'm really hoping he's slow playing a 10. Or calls with pocket nines, pocket sevens. He does not, all right. No, well, we gave him a chance, he didn't take it to bluff <laughs> it's like it's just i don't agree with it bro i don't understand any of it don't get it but i don't agree with it how can you say you don't agree with it when you don't even understand it silly boy all right i'm gonna check back this king queen right now it's a good flop for us for sure the razor now that we've got kings and queens i'm gonna go ahead and bet half pot 2.8 so that's generally one of the size choices we use after a check check flop. If we if we delay C bet, we usually use half pot. Probably pretty close to exclusive. So if we raise before the flop, somebody calls, flop is check check, they turn check the turn. I usually use half pot. Hey, all right, 27 big. This could be one of those spots where we spend some chips gambling. 5% 3 bet, 27, 14. King Queen suited. Do, 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 do. Let's see. Couple options here. I'm just gonna... Totally fine to jam here. So let's just fucking do it. 
See, we're trying to pick up six bigs. Let's go from 27 to 33. And if we get called, I mean, we have a pretty good hand. Like, obviously, we're dead against queens, kings, aces, ace, king, ace, queen. But other than that, you know, if they have jacks or tens, okay, we'll flip. But to pick up six bigs, it's pretty, pretty significant. With the king, queen suited. So you got the flat here. The squeeze is unlikely to have a very strong hand because he didn't three bet. So we're basically worried about the under the gun player. Well, Harkos, what the fuck? If he jumps the fence, this looks like jacks. He's thinking or tens or something. Oh, really in the tank this long. This is going for it a little bit. Could surely flat. There's no real raise to like, oh, we're we gonna make it like seven. No, because you can't really fucking raise fold this hand in this spot, so we're going for it. Sometimes they may be more curious too, because we got the bounty on our head. Maybe we get called by something goofy like King Jack. I doubt it. We don't have that big of a bounty. Alright, we're fucked. Come on, hold. What do you got, Jacks? Queens. Okay. King then. There it is. There it is. There it is. He needs the queen of clubs, right? So that's good. We win. Yay! <laughs> All right. Lucky, lucky. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? See, even against queens, you can win. All you need is a king. Ship it. Oh, my God. And then we'll give him a sorry. <laughs> What have I got now? I can't even see my hand. Okay, let's go back to 2.2. 2.2. Now we're doing good. Once again, back to about the average. It seemed like a good gamble. King, queen suited. Give it a go. Okay, that's a good flop for us. Kind of. I'm going to check this one back. Sort of trappy. I know it does make sense. How are you trapping with nine high? And now that's a good card for the Razor. On this boy, so we're going to bet turn in river. Okay, once again, right around half pot. Check back flop, bet turn. If he does not have a king, a seven or a five, we win right here almost always. Yep. And if he does, we'll probably hear from him. Okay, we're going to make it 2.2 here. <laughs> Brian Joy asking my reason for going vegan. It was many years ago, 2002. First was health. It was way, felt way better right after I did. You didn't, you, going to the bathroom was an issue before, like clockwork now. And then, of course, as I learned more about it, it became a combination of just, you know, um, the environment as well as just the suffering. Like, I like animals, you know what I mean? All right, this is an interesting spot. We're going to go for a uh, small bet with the ace-10. Josh Billingsley. We don't watch Californication lately, but because we've seen it all. But, yeah, she loves the, the character, David Duchovny, from that show. Okay, there's the ace. That's an interesting card now. Let's see. I'm going to go ahead and bet half pot. So we're offering him three to one odds. So if he does have like a straight draw and a flush draw, he can call. Right? But if he just has a flush draw without a pair or something like that, which is very unlikely. If he just has a straight draw, he can fold. All right, he's called. All right, I think this is too thin for value. In this specific spot, it's like I'm there. It's just really thin. Because you have to ask yourself, what do you get called by? This one's close. It's so close. Well... That's interesting. I wonder if he would have called a bet with that hand there. Hmm. Maybe. 
Maybe. Yeah. Really close. I don't know. Ace 10 there. No spade in my hand. Obviously, if you get check raised, you're, you're screwed. You put yourself in a bad spot. Obviously. And then, so, well, I, I don't want to share this one bit of information because the guys I work with don't want me to. Because it's a very important part of uh, some of the theory that we've worked on. Um, but I'll try to say it in a different way. Essentially, when you bet, when you value bet, you got to make sure that your opponent's going to call you with worse hands. Because if they only call you with like hands that beat you, well, that's not a value bet. That's called a value cut, right? You're cutting your own value. So then the question is this: Would he check call? Is it when he if he when he check calls? Is he more likely to have a hand that beats us, which is two pair probably, or is he more likely to call us with a hand worse than what we have? And that one was close. Okay, pocket jacks. I'm gonna go ahead and raise this up to six. And we're calling off, okay? We are raising. If he goes all in, he's going to do that with ace-king. 16 combinations of ace-king, okay? And then the hands of beat us is queens, kings, aces. There's 18 combinations of that. So it's pretty close to 50-50. If he also adds ace-queen, now you're talking about 32 combos, but whatever. Now we got a jack, a queen high flop. I'm going to check this one back. Okay. Not a lot to protect against here. We either have the best hand or we're drawing. So I'm going to go ahead and check again. We're repping ace-king now, right? Essentially, by the way we played it. Like, he's, you know, he's going to think a lot of the time we have ace-king. We happen to have jacks. And now we have that similar dilemma of thinking, what does this calling range look like? This one I think I have to bet. So we're going to do that. 7.2. Half pot. Figure he calls me with any pair here. Should, because like again, one of the biggest parts of my range that's three bets here is ace king. I could also have ace jack. And he folds. Okay, cool. Hmm. It's a good spot to do a little calculation. This is new theory poker versus old school. Old school is like, ah, if he re-raises me, he's, you know, he's gonna have this. You count the actual possibilities of combinations of hands, right? So if you have jacks, right? You beat. Let's say you let's say your opponent has. You know he's going to move all in with queens, kings, aces, or ace king only, right? So what do you beat? Sixteen combinations of ace king. How did I get to sixteen? It's four aces and four kings. Four times four, sixteen, right? So now, how many combinations of queens, kings, and aces are there? Well, how many combinations of a pair are there? Six. You got one ace goes with the other three. Another ace goes with the other two, and another one. Six combinations. So you got six, six, and six. So that's eighteen combinations. Have you dead? 16 combinations you're ahead of, but you're being laid a price because you've already got money in, okay? So in a 50-50 spot with two jacks, you call it off against that range. Now, it's an even better or an even easier call if you know your opponent is, is capable of having a wider range than that, if they do that with ace-four suited, ace-five suited, ace-queen. Now it's a slam dunk with jacks, right, against that range. Make sense?